In the Lord's Prayer, as recorded by Matthew, there is this. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, Jesus didn't start to- stop talking there. He said, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. All right? Now, the Greek, I, I, when I first read this, I thought to myself, and so, uh, so many of us have done this, we pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. I'm not, I don't think that's in Scripture anywhere, because in Luke it says, this is Luke 11, verse 4, Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, I think this may be a little bit helpful to people who have a hard time dealing with the idea that I forgive people who have sinned against me, because who, who can forgive sins but God? And they don't sin against me, they sin against God. But the truth of the matter is, there are people that that do step on our toes from time to time, that we're called on to forgive. Back to Matthew again. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The Greek, and I thought for a while, well, probably that's just a peculiarity of the translators. It really probably should be sin in Greek, hamartia. But no, it's not. In the Greek, it's ophelima, which is something owed, a debt. For example, if you sign your name on a mortgage to borrow money to buy your house, you actually created a debt. And that is precisely the same word that in the Greek would be expressed right here. Now, coming back to Luke again, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted. Deliver us not from evil. Now, what I take from this, these two passages are three synonyms. Sin, mentioned in Luke 11. Forgive us our sins, which is the Greek hamartia, just simply means to miss the mark. If you are in archery and the mark is set up there and you've drawn the bow and fired at the bullseye and you miss, you have sinned in archery terms in the Greek. The other word is debts, ophelima, something owed, and trespasses, paraptomai, to side slip or lapse. These three words in Greek are used synonymously. Now, what struck me this weekend when I was doing the weekend Bible study is in Romans is the way Paul borrows an analogy from accounting or bookkeeping. In Romans 4, verse 4, now to him that works is the reward reckoned, or sorry, reward not reckoned of grace, but of, if they were speaking Greek, they would be doing logizomai. They are doing the inventory. They are counting their merchandise and counting it up against their records so that they have a proper set of books for the end of the year. What we call in restaurants, the check, bring the check, would you please? The English call the bill. Please bring me the bill. The Germans call it the reckoning, kind of a sinister sounding word, the way it has come to be used, but really it's not. It just simply means give me the thing that you add up. Now, what's interesting about the mind of Paul when he's writing Romans, is the way accounting and accounting practices serve as his metaphor. I don't know why, all the years I've read through this, it never quite dawned on me, but what I tend to do when I'm reading the Bible, if something doesn't register exactly like it ought to be, it tends to start gnawing on me. And that thing in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, had been gnawing on me for quite some time. You know, what exactly am I to take from this? Well, when you look at what Paul says in in the way he handles this, you're dealing with something different. A debt, as I said, something owed. In accounting terms, it's a liability. Reckon is logizomai, which means generally to take inventory and to count up. You count up your assets, you count up your liabilities, okay? Now, reckoning appears 20 times in Romans... 12 times in the fourth chapter of Romans. And now don't ask me exactly why he used this analogy. Let's just take it for what it is, because that is where it comes from. Going back in Romans, let's just, I want us to walk through the, all the instances in Romans where Paul uses the Greek expression for take an inventory. Romans 2, verse 1. 
You are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are that judges, for wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you that judge do the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that commit such things. And do you think this, O man, that judges them who do such things and do the same, that you shall escape the judgment of God? Didn't hear it in there, did you? It's there. The word is absolutely there. It's the word in King James rendered think. Do you think you're going to be? Now, it sounds reasonable. It registers well. It goes through. But there's a funny thing about Paul, and you need to know this. Paul uses pl a play on words commonly in his writing, and he will take one word and he will beat it to death. He'll repeat it over and over and over again, finding in the repetition of the word a way to achieve emphasis. Uh, this happens in 2 Corinthians, I think it is, where he talks about, he uses the word comfort. And it appears there, I forget how many times, but the King James translators just couldn't stand the repetition, so they had to find synonyms in English for it. Paul didn't use synonyms. Paul hammered the idea of comfort, comforter, and I finally figured out when I, when I studied it, that what he means is the encouragement and the encourager. And this, this fits in all the places. And Paul was really hitting it hard. Well, he does the same thing here with the Greek word that says we take inventory. Now, what Paul is asking you is this. You who said, say, this guy is guilty over here because he does this. While you do the same thing, are you able to, how are you able to add things up to make that work? How do you add, do you, do you add this up that you who do, judge them who do such things and do the same thing are going to escape? I think reckon came into our vocabulary from the King James Bible as in, I reckon so. It means in common use, that's the way I add it up. Romans 2, verse 25. Circumcision verily profits, if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision is made uncircumcision. Now, how is that possible? Obviously, nothing physically happened to you. If you broke the law, having been circumcised at your, in the eighth day of your life, you're still circumcised. So in what way is your circumcision made uncircumcision? Read on. Therefore, if the uncircumcision... Keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? So when God sits down to take inventory on people as to who is circumcised and who is not, he is not so much concerned about the physical attribute of what happened on the eighth day or didn't happen. He is concerned about whether they keep the law or whether they don't. If a person is obedient to the law of God, if he keeps the Sabbath day, keeps the holy days, he doesn't steal, doesn't lie, doesn't bear false witness against his neighbor, God counts that as circumcision. It's an interesting thought, and one that I imagine Paul's Jewish readers probably had trouble with. I have little doubt of it because of the big argument that arose in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem conference. So, counted here means essentially entered into the books. So we are presented with God keeping a set of books in which liabilities and assets are rec reckoned, added up, and inventoried. Now we'll move on down to Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption in Christ Jesus. We all understand that this is one of the hammered themes in the book of Romans, is that we are freely justified by Christ whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. God just writes them off. To declare, I say, at this time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. And all of us understand how commonly the word believe is used in the Bible, and the word faith, and taking God, you know, believing and taking God at His word. The thing I think we have to understand is that if we are called for jury duty, when set and impaneled in a jury, and witness after witness after witness is called to the stand to testify as to what has happened, 
What you as a member of the jury are called upon to decide is whether you believe the witnesses or not. If you don't believe the witness, it's one thing. If you believe the witness, it's another thing. And other, oftentimes you will have witnesses saying exactly the opposite thing. The defense will hire expert witnesses to counter the prosecution's expert witnesses. And you, the jury, inexperienced as you are, lay person that you are, un unlearned in the law, but hopefully learned in common sense, have one question to ask. Which of these guys do I believe? And it's a choice that you have. It's yours. Now, we are given the same choice when it comes down to the resurrection of Jesus, whether or not we believe the witnesses or not. That's why, again and again, through the Gospels, it talks about, do you believe? And how that Philip asked the Ethiopian, if you believe with all your heart, you can be baptized. All right. To declare it his righteousness, that he, that he might be just and the justifier of them who believe in Jesus. Where is boasting then? Well, it's excluded. By what law? Of works? No. By the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude, we actually tie our inventory up, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So this is what we add this up to be. This is the way in the word again is used. Paul just keeps on hinting it. Our inventory concludes that a man is justified by faith and not by works of the law. Okay. Now we come to chapter 4, which is where he really uh, exercises this particular word. In Romans 4, verse 1, we'll come along here and read it as we go. What shall we say then that Abraham our father has pertained to the flesh is found? If Abraham were justified by works, he has somewhere ought to glory of, but not before God. For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness, logizomai. It went into the books as an asset. Now to him that works, the reward is not reckoned of grace. It is of debt. And there's the word debt, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. So when you look at this, you realize he is saying that the fact that you believe God. Now I'm going to have to say, add, you know, add this so that nobody misunderstands. Merely saying the words I believe doesn't get the job done. It has to be reflected in the way you go about doing things. I remember once we were traveling with a friend's wife and her two kids, stopped overnight in a motel and was hot, and we decided to take a swim with the kids. I had the hardest time convincing that boy to jump off the edge of the pool into the water for him to believe that I would catch him. And I did. And then he got excited about it. And the first thing I knew, he was jumping off at me before I wasn't even looking at him. You, you come to the place to where you believe enough to put your trust in someone. This is what we're talking about. And it's reflected in the choices that you make. Take Abraham as our classic example. God said, pack your duds, get your family together, arrange, let's say, all your affairs, and leave your home. Leave your father. Leave your kinsmen. I'm going to take you to a place that I will show you. Haven't showed him yet. I will show you that you're going to receive for inheritance. And Abraham, we are told, packed up and left, not knowing where he was going. When he did that, God said, this man believes me. And he shows his belief by the things that he does. And at that moment, God made an entry in the books. Abraham is a righteous man. Now, we know Abraham screwed up. We know he made mistakes. We know that he cause problems. You know, he lied on one occasion. And, and th these things we do know about, about Abraham. But they didn't count. And this is the strange thing that some people have getting their minds around. That didn't count. Now, was he free to sin? No. He was not free to sin. It was not good that he did. And it often caused problems that he did. But it didn't breach the relationship with God at any time. That's the important thing for us to understand. Now, the, the, the vocabulary of bookkeeping is being used. You do a day's work, you are owed a day's wages. It's reckoned as a debt. But to him that doesn't work, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. An entry in the ledger is made that says he's righteous because he believes. Now, even as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom the Lord God 
imputes righteousness without works. Now, first of all, counted, that's the same word, imputes, the same word. As I said before, this is one of the aggravations of all the translations, King James and, and NIV and all of them, is that their artistry in the language requires that they use var var variety in the vocabulary they're putting across here. But in doing so, they fail to carry the emphasis that the apostle himself is putting on the things that he's saying. All right. This is the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. God imputes it to you. So here you've got a ledger. And on one side of the ledger, you have got mistakes. You've got errors. You have got sins, as we would say. And they add up over time. One entry on the other side of that log, this is a man of faith, this man believes me, basically means God does not impute sin to you. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Impute, once again, the same word as Paul continues to hammer it through. He does not inventory sin to that man. Does that mean that you and I are free to steal? Oh, of course not. Does it mean we're free to bear false witness? No. We're free to go sleep with somebody else's wife? Why would I need to even mention that? I mean, the truth of the matter is we are not free to commit sin because sin has consequences and the consequences will come rolling home. What he is simply saying is that if you are following God in good faith, the fact that you in a moment of weakness, a moment of confusion, whatever it may be, transgress and incur a debt, God does not inventory the debt. You are still his son. Impute in both, both these verses is the word for inventory or reckoning and is not entered as one of your liabilities. It's entered as an asset. But that's only true if you have faith. If you presume upon God's grace, that doesn't work. Now, verse 9. Does this blessedness come then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. And Paul's, Paul has here an ironclad argument. And this one is going to slam some of his Jewish readers right up against the wall. Did this blessedness come upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcised? They would say to themselves, no, no, just for the circumcised, not the uncircumcised. But wait, if we, we say that faith was reckoned, there's our word again. If faith was inventoried to Abraham for righteousness, how was it done? When he was in circumcision or uncircumcision? Well, he was not circumcised at the time it was said. So here's an uncircumcised man, our father in the faith, who received the promise, who received forgiveness, who received this relationship with God in which sin would not be imputed to him. It was off the records entirely. It happened to him when he was uncircumcised. All you Jews, you know, who are out here reading Paul's letter, make, make note of that. And it's, it's ironclad. There's not much you can do with it. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while he was uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though he was not circumcised, so that righteousness might be inventoried to them also. Uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that you need someone to come along and tell you because you wouldn't necessarily come to it. God might have entered into this relationship with Abraham first, with circumcision, then counted everything for righteousness. He didn't. He made the statement very clear before he was, while he was uncircumcised. Why did he do it that way? So that he could be the father of all who are either circumcised or uncircumcised, it no longer matters with God. I think that is a fascinating thing and very important for us to understand. He received the sign of circumcision, verse 11, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while he was uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed, inventoried to them also. Now, Paul does this very commonly. He works a word to death, but the, and the translators just can't stand it. They have to make it a little more uh, art 
And so they have to use different words because they think maybe this is a little closer to what he means in this particular case. And in the process, they may be right about it linguistically, but they are wrong in terms of the emphasis that Paul is making. Romans 4 verse 12. That he might also be the father of circumcision to them who are not circumcised, but who walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham that he had while he was uncircumcised. So this is an interesting aspect of this thing. Now, all of you excuse me just for a moment because something has happened up here with my little microphone that goes over the ear, and I don't want to keep fighting with it if I can help it. So I'll get it back in place and carry on. All right, back to Romans 4, verse 13. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they who are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, the promise is made of no effect. Now, Paul is a difficult man to read in many cases, and you have to, you can't just toss this off. You have to take a little while to think through it. And what he is saying is simply this, that the promise that Abraham should be the, you know, the heir of the world wasn't given to them through the law. It wasn't given because of, he, of, of he'd have done this law and followed that law and that practice and the other one. It was because of the promise of God. Now, I think it is fair to say that God tested Abraham before he gave him this promise to know for sure that Abraham really did believe him. And once it came to the point that Abraham had demonstrated that he believed God, God really came down with the blessings upon this man for a reason. So that down through history, Everyone who follows that kind of faith will have the same blessings that Abraham had, regardless of their birth, regardless of their DNA, regardless of anything of the sort. For if they who are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is made of no effect. Where, because the law works wrath. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be made sure to all the seed, not only that which is of the law, but that which is of the faith of Abraham. And people struggle with this a great deal. You have to keep in mind that the Apostle Paul also is dealing with his Jewish readers with a mindset having to do with the law. Not merely the written law, but also the oral law, because they had built up an incredible edifice around the law, had built a fence around the law, the whole lot, so they wouldn't put one toe wrong where the law is concerned. And Paul is trying to help them to understand that that is not where it's at. It's not that the law is done away with, it's not done away with. He makes that very clear in chapter 3. The problem is not, though, that you can't Save your own hide. You can't do it. You, I mean, just because you keep the law all perfectly in all of its little aspects of it, unless or until you come to have faith in God, it doesn't get you anywhere. Except maybe it keeps you out of trouble with the law. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Before him who he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those things which are not as though they are who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations to that which is spoken. So shall your seed be. What he says here flatly is that the seed of Abraham is not limited to the DNA of Israel, or for that matter, even limited to the DNA of Abraham. That is Paul's point, that the inheritance now goes out, and those people are children of Abraham, whether they are in his DNA line or not, his family tree or not. And this is a hard thing for some people to get their mind around. I think, and I made this point in the uh, Bible study yesterday, that I think this has bearing on the doctrines, the prophecies of the end time having to do with the identity of Israel. Israel at the end time does not, I think, depend on a genetic descent, on the DNA of the people, but rather it depends on something entirely different. And that is whether or not a people adhere to God, whether they look to God as creator, whether they look to Jesus Christ. And of course, in the founding of our country, right from the very beginning, among the first words ever written were, all men were created. The word equal is convenient, but the word created is the operative word. That was right in the founding documents. And they were endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. So we started this nation that way. And candidly, 
because of the faith that we had that he was our creator, and because of the faith of those men who were the founders of this country, and they really were men of faith, more than most people are willing to acknowledge. Because of that, I think God looked down upon us and said, here is the Israel of God, as Paul would later use the expression. Paul uses the Israel of the God of God for those people in whom the Spirit of God dwells. The Christian folk, as it were. So, this is what we have to understand that Paul is driving at here. Now, being not weak in faith, Abraham considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old. He didn't consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith and giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform, and therefore it was inventoried to him for righteousness. Now, you know, there's, this is really down-to-earth stuff here. You've got to realize that Abraham and Sarah married all these years, no doubt had, had had many occasions whereby Sarah might have been pregnant. They had long, long, long since that convinced themselves, established the deadness of her womb. There's no hope, no point, we're not going to have kids. Also, from any indication I get, it had ceased to be between, either one, between them at all. As that of husband and wife, I gather, sex had basically stopped between the two of them because Abraham was old and Sarah was old and it just wasn't working. Imagine then, having been told by God, you will have a son, Sarah will have a son, the challenge that he faced the next night when he went into the tent. They actually had to do something. And as I commented on the Bible study, I suspect there was a lot of giggling going on in that tent that night as they took the necessary steps and began the, the process. God said, we have to do this, Sarah. And they did it. And Isaac would be born as a result of that. Anyway, he didn't stagger. It was imputed to him for righteousness because he and Sarah, God said he's going to do it. He's able to do it. I trust him. A bookkeeping entry was made which set off, again, all the liabilities that may have existed in those books. And believe it or not, there were some. Romans 4, verse 23. Now it was written for his, not for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now, candidly, that is a rather large challenge. What, how do you believe that? Well, I don't know about you, but I'll tell you how I do. I have read the testimony of the witnesses. I know that there were people who knew and knew that they knew that Jesus was graveyard dead. They took that body down off the stake. They saw how it had been bled out. They knew that he was dead. His body was cold. They wrapped him up and they put him in the tomb. This was a known fact. And then the next week, we have men meeting with Jesus, touching him, holding him, seeing the print of the nails, actually putting the finger out if they wish to do so and put them in the print of the nails, who now come to us and testify. They testify as to the birth of Jesus. They testify as to the life he lived. They testify as to the works he did. And most important, they testify to us of what he taught and they testified that he rose from the dead. So, do I, I believe it, because as a member of the jury, having sat here and heard their testimony, read it on paper, read their affidavits, I cannot conceive of a means whereby this would have all taken place as it did and be a total fraud. I believe the testimony that is there. Furthermore, I believe in the same way that, that little boy did, who when I wasn't even looking at him, took off from the side of the pool and called at me, expecting me to catch him before he hit the water, which I barely did. I have to be prepared, even if I think God isn't looking, to step off the edge. And that's the kind of faith that comes about. Do you believe that? Do you have that kind of faith in the resurrection of Jesus? Again, Paul makes this play on words about it was imputed to him that it can be, might be imputed to us. And the thing that imputes it to us is that we believe the testimony of the witnesses who say Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Now let's pass on down to Romans 6, because Romans 4 is where he just beats it to death. Very heavy emphasis, but he's not through with it. 
In chapter 6, verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more, death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. In that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, reckon you yourselves also to be dead to sin, but alive to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, as far as any claim that the books had on your life, you're dead. There is nobody, no one that can exact it of you any longer. It enters into the bottom of the ledger, this man died. And, therefore, and then so the life that you now live, you live by Jesus Christ. You live for Him. The books are balanced completely where you are concerned. And as long as you continue in faith, sin is not imputed to you. Now, I'm, I have to emphasize here, that doesn't mean that you can say, oh, well, God won't put this on the books. I'm going to go ahead and lie. That doesn't work. That absolutely does not work. So, take a look at your ledger. Add it up. You are dead as far as sin is concerned. Romans 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. You know, you can say, I think, you can say, you know, what all the synonyms are, but the fact of the matter is, he was saying that you can inventory it. You can tick off all the sufferings. You can put them all down on paper as a ledger. And then you can say, this is what we are going to get. They don't even compare. So again, the bookkeeping analogy tends to keep running back in here. Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, the sword... No, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted, he hits the word again, as sheep for the slaughter. They just add us all up. Here they are. There's, about, there's a dozen of them out here. They are going to be killed, slaughtered, sacrificed, whatever it is for meat in this. And that's what the world looks at us at. We are disposable in the world's eyes. But no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I am persuaded neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, you, I, I really think when Paul does this sort of thing, once again, he is following his analogy of tallying things up. He gives you this list of things that you could put on this side of the ledger of all the things that might separate us from God. Do they add up to enough? No, says Paul. Romans 9, verse 6. Not as though the word of God had taken no effect. They are not all Israel which are of Israel. This, this is an, another play on this idea of the circumcision who, if he doesn't keep the law, is counted as uncircumcised. Okay. They are not all Israel who are of Israel. How is that possible? Genetically, they may be Israel. They are not counted as Israel just because they are genetically a Jew, an Ephraimite, a Manassite, or a Benjamite. Neither, because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children. DNA-wise, they may be. In God's ledger, they are not. In Isaac, he says, your seed shall be called. That is, they who are the children of the flesh are not the children of God. The children of the promise are, count count are counted, tallied for the seed. Now, again, you know, basically, this is a comparison with Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael was what Abraham and Sarah tried to work out by the flesh. That wasn't what God wanted. That doesn't count. That's the analogy that Paul draws, beginning to try to explain to the Romans that the Gentile Christians are every bit as much part of the family of God, children of Abraham, as the Jewish Christians who meet with them. I don't know what he had heard from Rome. But it's pretty apparent as you make your way through the epistle to the Romans that he was under the impression that the issues that created the problems of the Jerusalem conference were still out there rattling around and causing a problem and a division among God's people there. So he says in Romans 14, verse 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus. There is nothing unclean to himself, but to him that esteems... He that inventories, he's back to his word again, the man that actually tallies this, 
as a thing unclean, to him it's unclean. It's again, a que it's a question of what's going on between your ears. What your intent is, what you think is happening here, this is what God is looking at. Because you may not really understand what you're, what, what you're eating and what it's like, or you, you may have not have that, that grasp of things. The question is, what is your intent relative to God? Are you presuming on His grace? Are you basically drawing your own image of God or making God over in your own image? Are you trying your best to be like Him? That is the issue here. Now, it's fascinating how Paul uses this word, logizomai, in his writings six times more than all the rest of the New Testament combined. It's dominant in, in his letter, and particularly in Romans, as a matter of fact, and particularly in Romans chapter 4. But 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God. That's the King James, and they have this one correct. The NIV, though, says, well, love is not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs. King James Version says, thinks no evil, and the NIV gets it right on this occasion. It underlines one of the great human failings. We do like to keep a record of wrongs, don't we? We like to know. We don't want to let it go. We keep a record of wrongs. Love, he says, does not do that, does not keep this record. And since God is love, God doesn't keep the record either. And this is a, you know, frankly, it's one of the most comforting things I've ever come to understand in the Bible. Is it's not as though there's this huge long reckoning of things that I've done wrong, mistakes that I've made, sins that I've committed, that I'm going to have to answer for. I believe God, and I'm trying in good faith to serve Him, to be obedient to Him. And therefore, I know that He's going to account that faith as righteousness. He's going to put it on the other side of the ledger, balance the books, and I don't have to worry about the debt side of this. Now, here's another place to consider the two versions. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. When I was a child, King James, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. The NIV, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man... I put childish things away. The NIV is a little closer here because what it's saying is I added things up like a child. But now I'm a man. I have to put away childish things. I have to think in the way that God does. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new and all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Reconciled is an interesting word. What do you do when your bank statement comes in? Hopefully, you reconcile it. Maybe. Some people don't. They just look at it and say, yeah, that's about right, and toss it in the, in the drawer, and they go on their way. But that's what we're talking about. In reconciling, in a bank account, you actually go down and look at your uh, cleared checks and, and ones that have not cleared and add the whole thing up. Anyway, that, but that's not the word. That's another word entirely. He has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses. There is the trespass that comes back into the picture. He does not log the trespasses, the debts, the mistakes, the screw-ups, the, the lapses that we have you know, in, in the Old Testament, there is this uh, distinction that is made between a sin of ignorance and a sin that is high-handed. And you, you read it along, and it says, if any man committed a kind of sin of ignorance, let him offer this offering. And you say to yourself, how can you commit a sin of ignorance? You know, do you mean that, that he didn't know he did it, or he did it and he didn't know it was wrong? I don't think so. When you get the whole context of it, I think what he's talking about is the contrast of a sin that is committed that is not high-handed. Because the, that distinction is made. And in your face, I know what God said, I don't care what He did. That is a different category of sin entirely from the weakness, the failures, the forgetfulness, the mistakes that we make, the lapses, which is the word that is used for it. These are things, I think, that are important for us to understand. Now, I think I lost my place on the page. But anyway, 2 Corinthians 10, 
verse uh, 2. I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some who think of us as though we walked according to the flesh. In both cases, the word is reckon or tally up. In other words, you take and you, you weigh up the evidence, you weigh up the stuff, and you have concluded to think that you hold this against people. He says, I think to add up against some who add up for us as though we walk according to the flesh. It's pretty close to our use of the word reckon, far more than merely to think. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4. If someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. But I, but I do not think, I don't add up, I, the tally is not right for me to be inferior to one of the least of these super apostles. Now, this is these, some of these are not that important, and the only reason I'm, I'm bringing them up is just to emphasize how Paul continually uses the same vocabulary so that we will understand or to really underline for us the meaning of what it is that he's trying to say. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6, Though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But I want to forbear, lest any man should think, tally, inventory of me above that which he sees me to be or hears from me. I'm not asking you to judge me or think about me in any way other than what you see. Add up what I do. Add up the way I handle myself among people. You can depend on that. Galatians 3, verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness... We've made full circle. We're all the way back to Abraham again and the fact he believed and it was counted. It's more important, I think, sometimes than we give it credit for being. And it's staggering to consider how one entry on the credit side of the ledger balances out all the debits on the other side. I don't think of this, though, as mere belief. It is committed belief, the kind of belief that leads a person to step out on space if necessary in the full trust that he'll be caught. Consider how Paul put it to the Philippians, chapter 3, verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, not as though I were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I don't tally this, that I have already added it all up, and I know that I am there. This one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, reaching forward to the things that are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What is that for? It says this, Paul's inventory did not include having it made. It knew that it was okay. He knew God had forgiven him. He knew the relationship was there. But he also knew that he still had to press toward the mark. He counted himself reconciled to God, but there was still much to be done. Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, this is an interesting example of it. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, inventory these things. Not just think, of, this is not a matter of mere meditation. It is a matter of add, add all these things up and take a look at them. Because it, you, and frankly, the truth is, if you can get off of some of the things that keep dragging you down in this world and add up all the things that are in the right side of the ledger, you're going to be a much, much high, happier person. And finally, or at least pretty close to finally, 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 16. At my first answer, nobody stood with me, but everyone left me. I pray, God, it will not be laid to their charge. Now that is what's meant by forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. People who may have done things that hurt us, that offended us, failed to support us when we deserve their support, these things we pray will not be laid to their... I ask God, don't make that ent entry into their ledger. Hebrews 11, and this is not quite the end yet, 
By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. And he's asked to offer him up. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which he received him in a figure. In other words, in his appraisal of things, he said to himself, God can raise this boy from the dead. He told me to do this, and he expects it to be done. I don't think that he thought God would stop him. I think he felt that he was going to have to do the deed. And I really think, I've heard lots of sermons about this, I think George C. Scott in the movie The Bible caught Abraham's spirit and feeling about this event better than any of the sermons that I have heard given about it over time. So, I want to summarize. Logizomai, an accounting term in Greek, is nothing but a metaphor. It is one Paul uses to impress upon our minds that there is a real truth in the way God treats our errors, our trespasses, our missing the mark our lapses. When we believe Him and act in good faith, the wrong we have done never gets entered in the books in the first place. And it's hard to understand that. And even maybe it's hard to trust it, but it is in trusting that statement that makes all the difference in the world. When we believe and act in good faith, the wrong we have done never gets entered into the books in the first place. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It is a crucial thing to understand. This is what Paul was driving at when he wrote Romans 4, verse 6, where we were before. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. It's a tremendous thing. You would do well to remember this when we sweat through the night watches over some wrong that we have done, or some wrong that has been done to us by another person who theoretically at least is in the faith. It's something to remember when we, in the Lord's Prayer we say, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. If you believe Him, if you act in good faith toward Him, your mistakes never get on the books at all. You may be chastised for things where you need discipline, but that's a good thing, not bad.